Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming back to fucking... You can't do this. No. <laughs> it's the hardest thing for me to do. It's the first bit. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in to another video on the Dark House Coffee um, YouTube channel. I'm one of your hosts, Brad. Jamie. And today we have... Nick. Yeah, Nick. 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 Nick maybe from <laughs> Assembly. Um, we're going to have a little chat, see what he's been up to, see he can talk about... We're going to be sitting and chatting. So, roll intro. Cool, so Nick. Yo. Assembly Coffee. Yeah. How's it been going? Good, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't know where to begin. Like, it's pretty weird having this conversation in the shadow of COVID, right? It is. It's really weird. Um, well, I suppose um, just for anyone out there who isn't aware um, of Assembly yeah. um, or what Nick does, um, should we wind it back and maybe talk a little bit about what? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, what's yeah? What is assembly? Like, what, what, oh, assembly, man. What, what? Yeah. What is assembly? Assembly is a coffee roastery, right? Mm. Founded by myself and a person, um, a guy, a human called Michael Cleland. But essentially, we're a coffee roastery which is rooted fundamentally in exploring ideas of collaboration in order to kind of evolve the narrative for what coffee means from a more consumer focused <laughs> level. Are you reading that from me? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> what made you want to start Assembly? What was wrong with Volcano? <laughs> That's what he's trying to say. I think, no, you know... No, 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 so it's like, because obviously you are a part owner in Assembly. Am, am, I, am I wrong? It is a separate... I'm company. a part owner in, the, in, the, in the, the, the group, right? Okay. So Assembly is a brand within a group, but Assembly ah, is, okay. the, is the net result of us I, acknowledging that the coffee industry was so diverse that in order to satisfy the needs of one customer set, you can't be something else, right? Yeah. And it was a, and it was an opportunity for Mike and I to kind of address what we believed to be the future for, what we thought were the, the coffee industry needed to go. And the assembly is the vessel for that, which is fundamentally understanding um, what it is that drives, you know, the motivation for consumers to engage with coffee through cafes. So at the beginning, I guess it was more about bringing in cafes closer to the to the to the working operation of a roastery. Yeah. Um, to like to, to gain insight into what it is the, to whatever the fuck coffee means to people, and that's been very true to this day, and still remains very true to what we do. And you guys launched your your brand in quite an interesting way, like through the um, coffee masters. To me, that that's. That's like an ultimate. Like, it's just such a great way to, to start a coffee brand. It, it, like, well, yeah, we had a unique relationship with the the actual people that design coffee masters. So we were the initial sponsor for that competition. And man, like going because I competed in coffee masters post that. Yeah. Um, and to see how it evolved in term, like and matured in terms of its complexity and efficiency and infrastructure and stuff. Because like I was literally on that first year of Coffee Masters brewing like 12 Technoforms and shit. In this little back closet thing at London Coffee Festival. Um, trying to set, like, trying to make the coffee taste good, but also obscure. Was it not out in the main? Nah, dude, it was very different, man. And like, at the same time, we were launching the assembly brand on like a big fucking stand in the far, like, northeast corner of the festival and shit. So we're like, it was pretty, it was hectic, but it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and, and so obviously you roast, um, for um, assembly, and you've been doing that for this, you know. I've been doing it again now since COVID, yeah. Yeah. To like um, compensate for all of the drop in production and needs and stuff. But I haven't like been a roaster for a while. Oh, really? No, we've got like. What a... do you do all day? Huh? What do you do all day? Well, that's the great question, isn't it? <laughs> no, my day to day role is sourcing and strategy, I guess. But like strategy from a. From a brand perspective in terms of that kind of sounds looking like. at growth opportunity. 
That sounds like a made-up job. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like a made-up job. <laughs> so what do you see? What, what do you really do? You play video games, don't you? Drumming. My motivation for the industry, I guess, is all get around sourcing. If you only had no money, I still had sauce. Mm -hmm. If you don't got no sauce, then we can, you, you, you lost. I always had it in my mind that you were roasting. I was in, in the beginning. I really enjoy roasting, I think. But though, to, to understand the progression of people through the ranks and like a company, I think roasting is one of those things that people are attracted to and want to understand. Mm. So like, it, it would be unfair of me to like hang on to that. Because I think coffee has like a unique proposition that is very, it's very people focused, right? Mm. And it has the cafe element, which is where all the engagements happen. And like, that doesn't happen in things like other commodities like chocolate or like maybe fashion a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. But like the, the because the cafe culture is fundamentally, I think, what is at the heart of coffee culture. That's the, the only reason people care about it is because they're in the social construct of the cafe, which has like pretty deep roots into like development and culture anyway. Like mm. it's where politics was talked about and, you know. And it's kind of like the daytime, it's a daytime bar. <coughs> Precisely, you, I mean, yeah, you, yeah. You are, you're consuming a drug. Yeah, and it's, you can't really like, one, you though. can't really overestimate that, I think, and people do take it for granted, I guess. <laughs> so here's the story. So I met Brad, fucking. <laughs> So I know Brad when he looked like Nick Carter from the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> Insert picture of Nick Carter. <laughs> Definitely. I'll never forget that because I was like, who's that blonde motherfucker at the bar? 52B or some shit, 42B or whatever. What is it? B4. B4. Yeah, the bar was called B4. Yeah, so that's when I met Brad and then forgot that you even existed until we met like four or five years ago here, right? Kind of like... Because you were the one that was, you were like, you don't remember, you do, you know? I was like... I've just got like, I'm awful with names. I'll meet you and within 10 fucking seconds, I've got your name. But uh, faces, I'll I'll remember someone I met yeah, a long time ago. And I, I remember seeing you and I was like... Oh, and, it, and was, it was a great, it was classic uni bar. And it was the first time, like, I literally just moved out of home for the first time. And that was my introduction to like reality or life or whatever. That's when I really experienced coffee from a sensory perspective, I think, for the first time and like appreciating it then. I remember going to Brother Baba Budan and I'd rock up and there was this fucking awesome barista there, which turns out it was Taylor Brown. Oh yeah. Yeah, who's a good friend of mine now. And like, uh, and I remember, because she made these banging coffees on this machine, that was a Cinezo that we got. Taylor made them. Taylor, yeah, yeah, sorry. She's fucking badass. I think if I had a favorite coffee brand, it would be hers now. Mm. Just because. Bro, <laughs> you're saving up right here. Uh, <laughs> well, it'll be me and then her and then me, uh, right? But anyway, that's when, and I remember like everyone has that like that moment, like what was the first coffee you had that like made you understand the potential for flavor or whatever? Because I had a friend that worked at the uh, auction rooms in North Melbourne and this barista served me something called Esperanza. I was like, what's that? He was like, ah, it's a farm. It was a geisha, right? And I was like, holy fuck, it was amazing. And then I tapped out. I moved to North um, Queensland for a bit and saved money, then moved to New York. What were you doing out in New York? I was drumming and playing drums on cruise ships, mainly. When, when you're a graduate musician, right, there's not much work for, like, jazz musicians, right? You're, you're either an artist or not, but it takes work to be an artist, and there's only very few cities where you can actually make that a commercial proposition, I guess. One of them is New York, the other one is LA. Like, everything I heard coming out of New York was what I listened to and wanted to be. So, like, I was a beeline sh straight there. Yeah. Um, didn't really have the balls to do it properly, I don't think. Being a musician is really tough, especially when you're in, when you get to New York and you realize how good the level is. It's fucking mean. I've seen the movie Whiplash. <laughs> yeah, Whiplash, man. <laughs> How many people have said to you that they've seen the movie Whiplash? Everyone. <laughs> when it came out, like, I literally get texts saying, hey, maybe I should like Whiplash. Because I knew I fucking hate it. I don't I only watch Every that. jazz musician on the planet that's actually studied hates that goddamn film. I bet they do. Yeah. yeah. Fundamentally, if you, if you want to think about the creative jazz world, New York is really still the epicenter. Like, how, long were you, how long were you actually there? In, in I was there on and off like 18 months, but like all punctuated by the cruise ship gigs. 
I think there's a different, uh, growing up being a jazz musician and a good one and a quite in demand one in New Zealand is very different from translating that into an artistic pursuit in the wider world. Yeah. You have to really fucking dig in, man. Yeah, like, do nothing else really, right? Like, yeah, I, I don't think I was really cut out for that in the end, but I, all I really wanted was to understand the people that I listened to, like my heroes, man. I've like I've been on the piss with all of them. Really? Yeah. And that was, I think that's the one talent that I actually have is just to be Drinking. fucking friendly. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and to convince people to get drunk when they don't want it. So yeah, so the cruise ship thing was interesting, but like, man, that's a fucking dangerous path to walk the, the ship, so you have to Why be- is that? Oh man, it's just a breeding ground for alcoholism. So I got fired for fraternizing the guests. Interpret that as you want it. Um, See, and you then get fired for that, dude. I thought, yeah. I thought that would just be like the only one of the only reasons to do it. <laughs> well, yeah, funny, but I think in the '90s, like the cruise ships. From what I've heard from like friends of mine that did it back in the '90s, like it was basically just a free for all drug trade. Yeah, it's just a bunch of people sitting on a boat having a good time. Bunch of people having sex and fucking, you know, doing what they want to do. But I, it became so rampant, I think people cottoned on, and, like, the, the cruise companies got sued a lot. So they just, they made these rules where you, if, you step, if you step inside a guest's room without being invited or having a letter from the captain, you're fucking out, right? Wow. I mean, it's a, it's a nice way to travel to a degree, but, like, not really. I was lucky because I did short contracts as a sub musical director, so I would come on for two months in the, on the holiday, where the, the main director was on 10-month contracts. They would fuck off okay. home for two months, right? And I'd come in there, and it was great. Cause limited responsibility. It was fun. I did all, I, I went all from Boston, all around Cape Horn, up to fucking Seattle, Hawaii, back down to New Zealand. Anyway, yeah, and then after the ships, I went back to New Zealand for like six months, and then started a, another band, and then we got a residency, and. England and came over here in the summer of 2012. Plugged away at the music stuff and then got back into coffee. But yeah, coffee was never like a thing. I never really saw it as an idea. I just thought it was like, it was easy to be a barista because you rock up and you make coffee. That's what we, we, we talked about this like last week, right? Just yeah. like... <laughs> but yeah. dude, like, and there's a yeah. social element. Like I think that, like people always are like, I remember the guys at Caffeine asking me to write an article one day on like the correlation between musicians and coffee. And the only thing I could think of was, yeah, exactly, was <laughs> the fact that neither of them require that much responsibility. If, you, if you're kind of somewhat don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Working in a coffee shop is a, it's a quite an easy and fun job, especially if you're in your early, early or mid 20s, or like even younger, but it's, yeah, it's just a fun job. But I don't think most people go and get a job in a cafe or hand their CV in as a young person or, you know, whatever, thinking, oh, this is going to be my life now. I mean, I, yeah. I, I guess we've all done it. Well, like, we all worked in coffee, what, like, eight, ten years ago. So saying, like, then, definitely not. I don't know what it's like now. When I started making coffee, I didn't, there was no, like, I didn't know anything about competition. Yeah. I didn't know, like... Yeah. And now there seems to be, like, a really, like, aware thing that this is yeah like an industry that has opportunities like i i always just saw it as like well like this is zero effort i can get by and then like oh shit i'm like getting promoted without really trying <laughs> yeah I, I mean i see a lot of people getting into coffee because they want to they really value the art form of being a barista or the science of like people really are attached to the idea of being a barista because of the making of the coffee? I, th I, I guess. I mean, I don't understand that. I mean, I, I, I do a little bit. I can, the, the, trying trying to, 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 to do something over and over again and get better slightly along the path. I, I can kind of get that. <laughs> to, to me, being a barista, it, it, was, it, was, it was the customers. It was like... For me, yeah, it was yeah, always... It was, it was people yeah, coming yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. I think baristas forget that ultimately being good at your job is to be the person that everyone wants to talk to and every wants every customer wants to engage with because they love oh, yeah, to that person. And that's what like that's where the criticism starts to have effect. And I think it's that is still ultimately true. Because I'll like have baristas come to us on jobs that I'll never hire because they work for some fucking roastery here or some cafe here where they reckon they have the utmost skills and extraction science. I'm like, yeah, that's not a thing. They don't have any social skills. Yeah. Well, yeah. they did, you know, it's just like... No, oh, like, I've definitely met baristas like that where you're like, oh, yeah, cool, like, you're really particular about this, this, and this, but, like, when you try and talk to a customer, you fucking... Suck. Alienate them and piss them off. Yeah. And, like, it's just... And, like, or yeah. just, like... And, like, no one wants to wait five 
minutes for a coffee just because you think you fucked up your recipe? Who gives a shit? Mm. Like, you, you, <laughs> what the fuck? Where, where I find my most enjoyment is at that point where we directly interact with our customers and, and like through the marketing and the branding and that conversation and that back and forth that you kind of end up some, some pushback and then you kind of, and then also just the positive nature that sometimes people have when they, when they speak about your brand and what it actually means to them. That to me is where I, I enjoy this industry the most because it, coffee is, a, it is an interesting thing where for some reason people hold it so true to themselves. It's, it, it, it's such a, like a, an essential part of their being mm. is that they drink coffee in a certain way. Yes. And it just, it seems so arbitrary to, that they couple this act to themselves. But because of that, then you have this like door into that person where then you can actually interact with them on a very, very real Absolutely. level. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, that, that, that's where I really quite enjoy it. I've always wanted a house in Italy, always. I'm a massive history nut, like some of my other degree is history. Dude, okay, so the Mayan language, there was 26 current Mayan <laughs> languages, right? Yeah, yeah, of yeah. about 130 that they've, they might have identified. But dude, the most fucked up thing is, the Mayan culture had, had grown, collapsed, grown, expanded, collapsed about four or five times before the fucking Spanish showed up, right? So the, the amazing thing is when you rock up to like Central America, by the time this fucking Spanish showed up, they couldn't reconcile these amazing fucking great cities ru in ruin that they had found with the indigenous people that were like, like just living in total primitive life, form, you know, hunter gatherer yeah, yeah. mechanisms. Because I was like, these people couldn't, surely couldn't have built this crap. What they didn't understand is that that civilization had been going for so long, it had already collapsed multiple times. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Do you know what I mean? It's fucking mental. And I think like, I, I have a real- Do they know why, they, why, why that stuff collapsed? Dude, yeah, because it's- Too many people? Uh, no, I think- yeah, but there, aliens. There was, <laughs> the one thing that the Mesoamericans didn't have was agriculture. And their cities were not built around, like you didn't have these big, you didn't have farms, you didn't have grain stores. They were built around ideas and political structures. And as soon as I guess you exert those dynasties over time, then people get sick of it and like, and then they disperse and then come back. At like, it's a very different way of relationship with the land, I guess. But my point is there is like, you know, understanding history is super important to me. Um, so I guess. So that's why you want to get a house in Italy. <laughs> yeah, because that's where I feel like fucking, dude, I just want to live and farm olives and shit. Well, I suppose on that beautiful note, maybe we want to cap this off. Sure. Yeah. Aye. <laughs> They're quick. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're definitely going to get some more guests in. Um, <laughs> fuck you guys, man. If you, if you have anyone that you think um, would be interesting to hear from that you think that this format might work well with, um, throw their name in the comments so we can um, figure out who you guys want to hear from. So, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it. All that shit. Like, subscribe. Like, yeah, subscribe, yeah, share yeah, with yeah, your yeah, friends. Yeah. If you got this far... Well done. Well done. Sick.